Hello, everyone. You are very welcome to this webinar, Demystifying Sustainability and ESG Reporting, part of the SUSTUB Clearstream Solutions 2023 webinar series. Uh, for those of you not familiar, SUSTUB provides a range of sustainability training services for all levels of an organization. And at Clearstream Solutions, we provide consulting services, again, across a whole range of responsible business issues, climate, carbon, products, and of course, uh, sustainability reporting. Oh, excuse me. So, so far we've covered scaling up the circular economy in this series. And for those who missed that, it's available on our YouTube channel. And our next session on the 31st of March will cover return on sustainability investment. That should be a really valuable session for anyone wanting to get to grips with the real practical, uh, measurable benefits of becoming a more sustainable business. So please do sign up for that. I'm Fran McNulty, and I will be joined shortly by my colleague Shay McGann, who will be leading it should be a, a really useful conversation, we hope, about the practicalities, the challenges, and the benefits of sustainability and ESG reporting with a fantastic panel of speakers, Manuel Menezes, Senior Manager for the Corporate Engagement Team at GRI, Joanne Grace, Head of ESG Governance and Reporting at Glanbia, and Susie Crawford, ESG Manager at Karen Holmes. But before we join our panel, I'm going to take you through a brief introduction to the landscape of sustainability and ESG reporting, including some emerging trends, some of the different types of disclosures and how you can set yourself up to to report effectively. If you have any questions, please do put them in the chat. We'll have some time at the end for, for uh, to take a couple of those. We will also be running a couple of polls to uh, get the perspective of all of you listening today. So first, some key trends, and these really speak to some of the reasons why companies are and will be reporting. So it's now a competitive issue. Uh, investors and customers require reliable, accessible, and uh, comparable ESG data in order to make decisions. We're also seeing a shift to climate targets that are backed by science, whether that's percentage reduction by 2030 or net zero by 20, usually 2050. And there's an expectation that these claims are, valid, claims are validated uh, by the likes of the science-based target initiative as being in line with limiting warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. We're also seeing companies maturing uh, beyond reporting just the actions they're taking to actually measuring um, external value chain impacts, whether that's uh, scope three, uh, your social value, your impacts on human rights and the environment. Double material reality is a big one that a lot of people I'm sure are, are aware of. So it's no longer going to be required to, to look at just the effects of ESG issues on the business, but actually the effects of the business outwards on the wider community and society. Regulation, and we'll talk about the, the EU regulation in particular shortly, is bringing thousands of new companies um, in, in scope. And they, particularly private companies, will be reporting many of them for the first time. And there may be a, a steep learning curve there for some. We're also seeing progress to bring ESG data uh, in line with financial information, really, to make it as reliable and consistent as financial reporting, and particularly with the uh, Corporate Sustainability due, uh, Reporting Directive, one of the EU regulations third-party assurance is going to be required on that information. Reporting on biodiversity and natural capital is becoming much stricter and more data-driven. And lastly, we're seeing an increased uptake uh, in the use of voluntary platforms and standards. And apart from doing this for your customers and your investors, it can really help prepare companies for those regulatory um, compliance issues later on. The next question is, what information are you reporting? And there's often a temptation here to jump straight to the end and get bogged down in the detail of all the frameworks. But if we just take a step back, everything you'll be asked to report is a standard part of a well-rounded sustainability strategy. And if all of these elements are, are built in from the start, you'll naturally have the answers when it comes to reporting. So firstly, it's about sustainability issues that are material or relevant to an organization. Those might be universal, like human rights, sectoral, say a construction company having some different issues to a tech company, or related to your particular organization's context or your business model. And to understand what's relevant, 
you do a materiality assessment and, and look at a number of different things, which include who are your stakeholders, investors, employees, um, customers, communities, every business will have a whole range of stakeholders and you need to understand what matters to them and what information they need in order to understand your activities. It's also critical to understand your impacts, whether that's the company's impacts outwards on the environment and society or the impacts felt by the company because of those external factors. And you have to understand the risks that come with these issues. Apologies, clicker broke there. <laughs> the risks that come with these issues. Um, an example would be how exposed your supply chain is maybe to climate disruption. Um, you also need to understand the opportunities. So how can you create value through addressing some of these issues? Uh, maybe you can attract new customers by offering greener products. Maybe you can save money even by uh, switching to renewable energy sources. And once you understand the impacts, it really comes down to how you manage them day to day, how they're integrated into decision making with a strong governance structure. And last, but certainly not least, is data. So what data are you collecting to monitor these issues and set goals and provide evidence for the claims that you'll be making when you're reporting? And usually this information takes the form of metrics, that show where a company is at and how that position has changed over time. So for the benefit of all levels of knowledge on this call, and what are some of the issues you might report against? And typically they just fall into a few categories. So ESG, environmental, social, and governance. And just a few examples. Under environment, you have climate change, water, biodiversity. Under social, you'll have society, customers, and community with issues like human rights, um, responsible sourcing as well. You'll also have your own workplace and workforce, things like labor practices, inclusion and diversity, and employee well-being. Under governance, you'll have ethical business practices, issues like regulatory compliance and data protection. And lastly, financial issues. So financial management, um, customer products and services. There, there are many, many more, but this gives you a flavor of the types of issues that come up. Next question is how do you report? And uh, this is where things can begin to feel a little bit overwhelming, but it's helpful if you can see the landscape as broken into four broad buckets. So first you have regulation. These are the legal reporting requirements based on where your organization has a presence. So the International Financial Reporting Standards Foundation, the IFRS, are developing global standards for sustainability disclosures that can be adopted by any country if desired. The Security Exchange Commission, Securities Exchange Commission um, in the US has proposed regulation for the disclosure of climate related risks, um, carbon emissions data. In the UK, some companies are required to disclose energy use, carbon footprint, um, again, climate related risks. And this year, the Sustainable Disclosure Requirements or SDR in the UK will provide a consolidated set of rules. In the EU, we have a whole series of non-financial regulation, which we'll, we'll talk about shortly. The next is voluntary reporting frameworks and standards, such as the UN development goals, a common one that companies can align to and report against. Others like the TCFD, the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosures, um, which incidentally is actually mandatory for, for some companies in the UK, and focuses specifically on climate related risks and opportunities for financial value. And GRI, or Global Reporting Initiative, and provides universal and sector specific standards for disclosures. Next, there's benchmarks and reporting platforms. And this is a sort of catch all category uh, for disclosures that are sectoral, like GRESP, um, which is a benchmark for the construction and real estate sector. And then you also have CDP, the Carbon Disclosure Project. Uh, which scores companies' environmental performance, um, platforms like SEDEX and Ecovatus, um, which help you assess the sustainability performance of companies within your supply chain. And reporting against these often is done at the request of customers and investors because the scores or results can be compared across a number of organizations. Lastly, you have ESG ratings and indices, uh, which are more applicable if you're a PLC maybe, but these rate your performance in managing um, environmental and sustainability risks on your business. And the ratings would then be used typically by investors to make decisions. 
So the four main uh, EU non-financial reporting regulations that have been developed to support delivering the objectives of the EU's uh, Green Deal are the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, CSRD, which requires disclosure on impacts, risks, opportunities associated with a, a really broad range of ESG issues. And it applies to all companies already covered by the non-financial reporting directive. Um, don't, don't worry, we'll know who you are if that includes you. Um, and they have to report in 2025 on 24 data. They will be followed um, a year later by all public and private companies who have uh, who fall into two of those three categories outlined there. So 250 employees or more, 20 million on the balance sheet or 40 million in turnover. And um, it also applies to non-EU companies with significant undertakings here and SMEs, their credit institutions will follow in 2027. The Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive is focused largely on due diligence for environmental and human rights in your value chain, maybe particularly in your supply chain. But you must also demonstrate that you have a business strategy aligned with keeping warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Um, while some countries like Germany, for example, have already introduced legislation for most, it's probably going to come in around 2026. And it will be primarily for large companies over 500 employees um, or and or um, 150 million in turnover, uh, also smaller companies in some high impact sectors. The EU taxonomy is a classification system for environmentally sustainable activities and companies must disclose the extent their activities are aligned to those. So among other things that might be the share of those activities contributing to turnover, CapEx and OpEx, uh, those already covered by the NFRD or the sustainable finance um, uh, disclose, sustainable finance disclosure for regulation are compliant from this year, and it'll apply to others um, following the CSRD timeline. And the sustainable finance disclosure regulation finally applies to financial market participants. So that's um, investment firms, pension funds, and they have to disclose the ESG risks and impacts at an entity and a product level. And it's designed to, to really direct flow of finance into sustainable activities. There are some known unknowns, given the ambition of some of this legislation, particularly um, CSRD. So how will companies perform double materiality assessments, uh, given that it's focused on both the outside in and the inside out impacts? This might be a significant leap for some companies. We may see companies taking a, a kind of a phased approach where they're delving into greater detail each year around those impacts, risks, and opportunities. Um, how will sustainability information be assured? This is new territory. CSRD requires the assurance by a third party on your ESG disclosures. So how will that work for the likes of your supply chain or scope three data, uh, which, as we all know, can be really challenging um, when it comes to getting reliable and consistent uh, information. How will private companies report? So for those who don't already have public reports, will they start issuing full sustainability reports? Um, will there be a section on their website? Will we start to see platforms and tools coming into play? Who will be responsible for regulating this uh, here in Ireland? You know, who will ensure that eligible companies are reporting and that they're compliant? And uh, lastly, um, what are the repercussions if you're non-compliant? Will there be fines and how will that be managed? So lots of interesting, interesting things here uh, to watch as, as we get closer and, and begin um, reporting against CSRD in particular. Lastly, what are our recommendations? Um, these are, are some of the practical things that we see uh, our clients doing. And firstly, you, you start with your ESG strategy. So as we said earlier, everything you need to report is going to be addressed as part of developing one. Um, and it's integrated then into business as usual. You do a materiality assessment to understand your impacts, your risks, and your opportunities and uh, what your stakeholders care about. You develop the data management strategy. So all of these disclosures are going to require a lot of data. It's going to come from different sources inside and outside your organization. You need a, a system for, for managing that over time, um, particularly when it comes to auditing. Uh, develop an ESG reporting roadmap, review your obligations um, in relation to regulation, also what your peers are doing, um, what your stakeholders expect, and then develop a stepping stone approach that's going to allow you to increase your ambition over time, and um, really build up the internal resources. Undertake gap assessments against the different frameworks and review what information you have that's missing, develop action plans, 
and uh, build your maturity that way. So uh, our team here at ClearStream, we, we can support on all of these processes and uh, we will be really delighted to engage with any of you out there, whatever stage you're at on your journey. Um, we'll share some contact details at the end, so please do get in touch. And with that, I will hand over to my colleague Shay and our panel. Thanks, Fran. Uh, so I'd just like to welcome uh, our panel on screen now. Uh, we're joined by Susie Crawford from Cairn Homes, Manuel Meneses from GRI and Joanne Grace from Glombia. So thanks very much for joining us today, guys. I hope we'll have a really rich conversation. Um, and before we get into it, uh, we're just going to start with a quick poll. Uh, so that should come up on your screens. We're just going to ask you at what stage you are in terms of your reporting journey. Oh, no, we're not. <laughs> um, I, or you can answer this one. <laughs> so this, this comes with our second question, but what type of reporting framework does your company find most useful? Um, I'd, I'd just answer that now and we'll come to it uh, during the discussion. Um, so yeah, so just to get into the discussion while people are answering that, Susie, I'll come to you first. Um, you might just introduce yourself, uh, Karen Holmes, who you work for, tell us where they are on the reporting journey and then what it is you actually do. How are you? Um, I'm Susie Crawford and I am the ESG manager for Cairn. Uh, Cairn Homes is a leading house builder in Ireland, so um, moved up from, from tiny output of a small number of homes to over looking like 1500 for 2022. Um, so really, um, really a company that's been growing an awful lot. Um, my responsibility is around ESG, so kind of starting with strategy and taking it all the way through driving new initiatives and, and supporting them by talking to people around the business and then ultimately for our kind of reporting and uh, target setting. Um, I don't know if I covered all your, your questions there, Shay. Who I am, who Karen is, what my job is. Um, yeah, no, that's great. Um, uh, Joanne? Thank you. Sure. Um, Thanks very much and, and delighted to be here today. Um, uh, my name is Ron Grace. I work for Glambia PLC as head of ESG governance reporting. Um, I'm an accountant by trade. Um, I joined Glambia in 2013 and I, I guess I've worked across the group um, in different roles um, and I suppose both within a financial and um, non-financial guise. So I think that's that stood to me in good stead in this current role. It's very much a cross-cutting role and kind of collaborating across the group with, with different aspects um, of the business. And um, I guess if you were to summarize in a sentence what my role is about, it's very much overseeing Glombia's compliance with ESG reporting requirements um, and making sure we're meeting our stakeholder um, demands. And that's really about embedding structures and discipline around how we report. And um, just in terms of some context to Glombia itself, um, and it will lean into to what frameworks and regulations are uh, relevant to us. We're headquartered in Ireland and um, in Kilkenny, which is the office I'm associated with. Um, we're listed on the Irish and London Stock Exchange, so we're subject to um, EU and UK reporting requirements. So things like the CSRD that Fran mentioned, TCFD, taxonomy, that's all in scope for us. Um, just in terms of Glambia itself and what we do, um, we're primarily a nutritional company. So we work off two key platforms, one being um, performance nutrition, which focuses on um, branded sports and lifestyle nutrition products. So um, brands like Optum Nutrition, Nutramino, Amazing Grass, um, Slimfast, they're, they're, they're all Glombia brands. And then on the other side, we have um, a nutritionals business, which is more business to business focused. Um, and that focuses in our, around our customized solutions, ingredients, flavorings type, capabilities so very much innovation led and we also have a, a dairy processing and cheese manufacturing business as part of that so um the scope three elements and, and dairy is, is a key element in, in terms of our environmental um, metrics um in relation to our reporting journey um we've made a lot of strides over the last few years and, and some of those have been forced on us because of the the regulatory landscape we're in so in 21 
we reported for the first time under a TCFD in the new taxonomy. And we have a very clear line of sight on what's coming under CSRD. So um, that's kind of frameworks. And then I guess from a government's point of view, a significant change has been um, the appointment of an ESG committee board. Uh, and that's really kind of set the tone at the top in terms of how important um, our ESG agenda is. Uh, and the reporting pieces is an element of that. So hopefully that gives you an insight. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks, Joran. Um, and Manuel, I'll finally come to you uh, from, from GRI. You might just give us an overview of the, the, the GRI standards and, and why you would recommend to, to the audience on the call today to use uh, the standards or to start using them. Thank you very much, uh, Shay, for the for the invitation. And thank you, of course, for, for clear team, uh, to Clear Team Solutions for giving us the opportunity to be here sharing with the audience today. Um, let me share you something about GRI, but first of all, I'm part of the, the corporate engagement team within GRI, so much of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis is engaging in conversations, very interesting conversations with the users of the standards, being them reporting organizations or being them service providers. Um, I'm the contact person for many or some European countries. Unfortunately, my colleague, who is the contact person for Ireland, um, couldn't join us today. So if there would be any questions very much related to the local landscape, I might not be able to provide all the details, but I will be glad to put you in contact with uh, Kate. So when it comes to GRI, and Shay, just let me know, do I have a couple of minutes for this? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Just to be, to be very sure. Okay, let me uh, start by um, saying that GRI is an independent international organization. We're based in Amsterdam. Um, and as many of you know, GRI offers a global disclosure framework to support companies being transparent about their sustainability performance, but also accountable for their impacts on and um, on the world around them. The GRI standards, and this is something very important to understand, are a free public good. What does that mean? It means that any organization can just go to our website and download the standard, and any organization can use them to put together a sustainability report at no cost. Through the GRI standards, we help businesses disclose their sustainability impacts, providing highly relevant insights for companies and their stakeholders, which then can inform decision making. This is also something very important to clarify because as a global standard setter, GRI does not validate or certify sustainability report. This is a question that we get, we get all the time. Who will be doing this? Your different, your different stakeholders will be looking at your report and they will be taking decisions. Think about not only investors, but also think about employees or customers or regulators or the communities within which you operate. Now, the GRI standards have become the leading global practice for sustainability reporting. Around 11,000 companies publish a GRI report on a yearly basis. There is a very interesting survey that every two years is uh, published by uh, KPMG, and they were looking at the largest 5,200 companies, and it showed that 68% of them report using GRI. But when you're looking at the top 250, then the number is 78% of the companies. And interestingly, last year, we had over 1 million downloads of our standards for the first time. And we think it has to do about like the increased interest around sustainability reporting and, of course, everything that's going on in the landscape. Back to your question of why would I recommend your organizations, people who are joining us uh, today to start using ERI, if you haven't gotten started, I would just mention a few points here. Uh, first, of course, ERI would allow uh, for comparability with other organizations globally. It also provides credibility and alignment, this is very important, with other international instruments. Think about, for instance, the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights or the OECD Guidelines for Multinational Enterprises. GRI would also provide you a structure for reporting and providing information to different stakeholders. And this is very, very important. When people are thinking about GRI and reporting, it's not only about reporting, but it is a framework that really allows you to better understand and manage your present impacts and anticipate future ones. So this is really, really very strategic. 
And um, once I had a conversation with a very large reporting organization in Germany, uh, and this person told me the GRI standards are very useful to show inside our company what is expected from us outside the company. So I would close with this because I know that there might be opportunity to connect with everything going on at the landscape level and why should people uh, report with GRI? Brilliant, thank you, Manuel. That's that 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 that's a really good overview. Um, and I think for people on the call today, even if you're not thinking in the short term to 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 down, to to use GRI as a framework, go and download the standards. Just start having a look at them. It, 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 it's really worth worthwhile. They can they can inform how you get on your journey uh, in terms of reporting. Um, so yeah, so I suppose we'll just move on to our, our second area of discussion. So the frameworks. Um, and I'll come back to you, Joanne, maybe um, in terms of the, the, there are obviously lots of frameworks out there and it's often where people start rather than the, the strategy. Um, would you give us, I suppose, take just tell us firstly um, what uh, frameworks and standards you are using yes. and then maybe uh, go, go into a benefit and a challenge of of um, of one of the main ones you're using? Yeah, OK, so look, as, as I said, as a PLC, we're subject to the EU and UK requirements. So currently we report under the non-financial um, reporting directive, which will eventually evolve into the CSRD. Um, we report under EU taxonomy as a result of that, um, TCFD. And then from a voluntary perspective, um, we're aligning with the GRI standards. Manuel will be happy to hear uh, for the first time this year. So we're doing a comprehensive project around that and we're due to issue a report in before H, the end of H1 this year. And we also aligned to the UN SDGs. We report under CDP. Uh, we avail of um, Ecovadis and we have other external accreditations around some of our key um, ESG um, targets and metrics, including the science-based target uh, initiative around our spoke one, two, and three emissions. So it's kind of a broad church. There, there's a lot of moving parts. I would see, say we are seeing consolidation in terms of frameworks and requirements with the likes of the, um, the SRS is coming under the EU uh, Corporate Sustainability Directive and also um, IFRS. So, you know, th there's a lot out there, there's a lot of moving parts, but it's certainly, we are seeing um, some consolidation. Um, I guess in terms of like two of the, the key or most significant changes we've made as an organization would certainly be aligning to the GRI framework. Um, and the big advantages we see with that is it, it adds discipline to how and what we report. So it gives structure, it removes the ambiguity of like, how will we tackle this topic? Um, it, it's forced us to identify what our material topics are in a very disciplined way. Um, and I think more importantly, we've had to develop out a network and structure within the organization because ESG touches all aspects of the group and, and just to ensure sustainability in terms of the right people know what they're required to do. And um, I suppose have a clear view, as Manuel said, of the external view of what's expected of us. It's been very good to lay out a structure and we've uh, we've had a project manager working on the implementation of GRI um, over the last 12 months. And, and that's been a, a significant resource uh, and really and really helpful in terms of um, bringing you know, all aspects of the of the group up to a, a required baseline. Um, we see it as, as a good practice or a good run for us to be ready for um, the ESRIS or the ESRSs. Um, I call them ESRIS, but uh, diff different acronyms and even how we say them is different. But just because um, when we look at what FRAG have done, they, they, they've, they're um, drafting those standards on existing frameworks. And we see GRI and TCFD as being two key inputs. So the thinking from our side is if we're good on GRI and we're good on TCFD, you know, we're largely on the way to meeting um, the ESRA requirements. Um, and it's also meeting a number of, of needs, as Manuel said, like it's it's a broad um, it's a broad view. So it's meeting a lot of stakeholder needs like we would be interacting with customers and we're certainly seeing greater demand in terms of the level of um, ESG information they're requiring and the granularity of that. So the discipline around um, the GRI framework has been really useful. And also on the investor rating um, agencies, again, we're seeing just way more focus on that. Um, and, and we obviously want to maximize um, our scores there. And the GRI piece is important. When we look at the investor ratings, 
they very much score you on what's publicly available. So even though if you have if you have initiatives in place, but you don't publicly disclose on them, you're not getting the credit for it. So the, the discipline with GRI is, is helping us in that space as well. So that's kind of one I, I'd focus on. The other one being TCFD. Um, I'm sorry, actually, I should say the challenge with, in relation to GRI. The key challenge really is, is around you're kind of leaning into to people within the business that are very busy um, and it's an additional ask. So for us, it's it's around, you know, providing enough support and structure so that they can deliver what we need from a reporting point of view and they can see the value in it. And it's kind of becoming a business as usual requirement as opposed to an additional annoyance or ask. Um, so that's probably one of the key challenges that we're working through and ensuring that we have the right resources um, applied as we because uh, this is only going to get bigger. That's the reality of it. So I think that's probably enough. I can touch on TCFD, but it's may, maybe overkill in terms of uh, level of detail. We, well, yeah, we can get into that um, yeah. if, if we have time. Um, and are you, Joanne, are you seeing a, a lot more questions coming from your investors on all of this? They obviously they're on a steep yeah. learning curve as well. So um, are yeah. you having to, to to get involved in those discussions? Yeah. And, and even like they will use, um, say, a sustained analytics report or an MSCI report and they'll quote you know why why is why are you at this score can you explain what you're doing to remediate it or you know it's very much like they're leveraging all kind of avenues and then challenging back towards us so like that interaction is happening all the time now yeah uh, I suppose what I've seen in the companies we work with there some of them are asked questions by their investors like some some quite small companies we've worked with have have been asked to respond to GRI for quite small companies and you're like that's a big undertaking. Does the yeah. investor nearly understand what they're asking that small company to do, and do they have the resources? So, I do think for some of the companies on the on the call today, if 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 you're small, if you don't have a huge a big team, or just just I think work with your investors. Don't just take what they ask for as like as uh, as gospel that I, I definitely need to do this um, because there are as we've mentioned, there are lots of different frameworks and ways to disclose this information and finding the ones that are right for you is really important. Um, but yeah, th thanks, thanks, Joanne. Um, Susie, I might come to you, okay? Sure. Um, just something you said there about for, for smaller companies. Um, I do think some of this is learn by doing and some of this is it's not going to work if you wait until you have a perfect strategy and a perfect data management plan. Some of it is just pick a couple of things, and get started, and you'll you'll start naturally. It'll happen then. You'll start to build out your your kind of internal capabilities for managing the data and for gathering all the information that's needed. So I would say that don't don't wait for perfection. Just kind of start small and build it up, which is what we did. So kind of three years ago, we started with a research, what's everyone else doing? Like, what are our peers doing? Um, started at that research point, did our materiality assessment, a lot of what Fran had described there, that kind of sequence um, and strategy, and then started to report. But even in our first, the 2020, 2021 report was more of a statement of intent. It didn't have GRI or SASB or any of those kind of things. It was just, We've, we've determined that this is something that we need to do. And here's what we're, we'll identify the right frameworks over the next 12 months and we'll start reporting the data. And then the following year, we started with, and we're trying to keep it relatively streamlined on the number of frameworks, but at the same time we do SASB, the home builders um, requirements. We are on a phase basis. So I guess very different to what Joanne describes, we don't have a project manager for GRI. So instead, we first of all decide what are we reporting that we can do that lines up with the GRI definitions. So we'll use the GRI definitions to report rather than Susie Crawford's definition of how we report our waste data. We'll use the GRI's version of it and do it in line with those. And then this year, we've just expanded that a lot more. And then maybe next year, it will be a full GRI report. And that's the kind of the plan of action for a company that's growing and mid-sized, but isn't it? global corporate with a, a huge amount of resource I think that's a, a sensible enough approach rather than saying this is a bit scary I don't think we'll start yet <laughs> um so that's how we how we've done it we also report under TCFD 
um, did a lot of good work this year on scenario analysis, understanding, and it sounds really scary, some of this, but you, it's a matter of taking a step back and breaking it down. So you think, okay, what's a one and a half degree world? What's a three or four degree world? And what would the impacts be on our business? And really think about it and break it down. So it doesn't, when you get into it, it's not as terrifying as it seems from, from a distance, like a lot of things, I suppose. Um, so that's that's what we're reporting um, as to benefits and challenges. Uh, it, the phrase, I actually wrote it down here, a free public good, like that is the perfect way to describe the likes of GRI. The big advantage is that it shows you what you need to do and it shows you where your gaps are. So even with the CDP, you know, it's it asks you for information around your carbon reporting and it asks you for your biodiversity and in so doing, and it asks you for governance structure, you have to think about the thing is, am I happy to be reporting this or is there a way that, that when I'm writing it down, do I see, oh, this could be better. And um, so I think it does direct you to kind of improvements by virtue of reporting to them. Um, and then they obviously, you know, it's comparability and benchmarking. You know, when you put out your data and it's reporting exactly the same way as your next comparator, there's there's nowhere to hide, which is good for, for stakeholders because they know what you're up to, but it's also good for any company. You know, it, it forces you to look at things that aren't, the, and they're not always on the cost side. So if you think of something like waste management, you know, that's, it's a big benefit to Karen if we were to notice that ours is out of sync with our comparators, um, because there would be cost savings there too. Um, the challenges, the challenges, like the, it's it's blindingly obvious the challenge is collecting all that information um, from such a diverse range of sources. So I just think you might be going for, okay, what is the staff turnover for women over 50 one day? And the next day you're like, do we have any non-hazard or any hazardous waste? And if so, what does it look like? The things are so the breadth of what you need to collect. Um, when you think of financial reporting, you know, everything is the same unit of measure. It's all in, well, there'd be different currencies potentially if you're a really big company, but broadly speaking, it's all in the same, the same unit of measure. Um, so yeah, I think having the right resources internally is really, really important. Um, like the skills of an ESG analyst, because what you're talking about is so broad. I think it's a mixture of skills and nearly personality. Like there's a level of kind of um, open-mindedness and flexibility and adaptability that nearly it has to be part of who you are. Um, the skills, obviously data and, and persuading people and influencing those kind of things, but um, some of it is more about personal kind of being excited and passionate about it probably brings you over the line when it comes to the tenacity for the detail in the end. Um, so yeah. Brilliant. Thanks, Susie. Uh, I think it's really interesting what you said there at the start about that, the perfection. Um, I don't think there's many companies on the call that will be able to go from <laughs> downloading the GRI standards to full compliance. So having a bit of a reporting plan as to how you're going to get from, from the start to being able to say you're fully aligned is, 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 is and I, I don't think there's any problem with that. Like all you have to do is be transparent about that. Um, say this is your your journey. Um, they are like uh, Manuel may may touch on this, but there there are, I think it's a thirty four topic standards. Um, there there's a lot to go through. Uh, so so just having a think about that and how you could could integrate them. Um, the good thing with SASB say is that SASB's kind of done the materiality for you, so it's it's a much more simple framework to 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 do. Um, but uh, yeah, M Manuel, I might just come to you. Uh, you might touch on obviously you've heard all the, all the fr the frameworks there, um, but we know every time there's a, a new framework or um, comes on board, GRI does a lot of work to show its alignment. So you might you might touch on some of the resources that are that are out there available for companies to use. Um, yeah, yeah, sure. And, and and we're working a lot in this space to try to provide support to people who are uh, working on, on putting together a sustainability report, which I would say it's a whole journey. And not for each sustainability report, but the whole process is a continuous process um, that takes 
time, a lot of time. And uh, I'm taking notes here about uh, Joanne mentioning the challenges of really leaning on people who are extremely busy and which not all the time understand why are we asked to be providing all of this data, all of this detailed information. I also hear uh, Susie saying the same challenge around collecting information, having the right resources set in place. And, and yes, Susie, I like how, how, you, how you mentioned this. It doesn't have to be perfect. And that's my approach. When I engage in conversations with many organizations who want to start reporting, they would see the GRI standards and like, where do I get started? So organizations can report in accordance with the GRI standards or with reference to the GRI standards. If you're new in this space, I would invite you start reporting with reference to the GRI standards. It's a journey, it takes time. It will help you get familiar with the standards, with the disclosures. But take a look also at our universal standards. Again, it's a free public good. You can download the standards, take a look at them, get familiar with the principles of reporting with GRI because reporting with GRI is based on a set of principles. Um, and this is also a huge differentiator and where a lot of the value of reporting with GRI lies. Um, but you can start from there. It's better starting from that point and trying or attempting to do something for which you might need to uh, structure some internal processes. You might have to get the buy-in from other internal stakeholders, which takes some time. You might have to communicate and convince other people in other departments to provide some data for which they should uh, put some systems in place. Um, but anyway, just wanted to touch upon those those uh, points, which I think it's important for the for the audience that is with us now. And trying to get back to the framework, I I agree with uh, what uh, Joanne was saying about uh, we're seeing a lot of consolidation in this space. I think it's a very interesting time uh, to be in this space because yes, this is the alphabet soup and it's full of acronyms, and from GRI, we think that we should be building a global reporting effort uh, in which we have much more alignment between the definitions and the disclosures. And we see things that are moving that direction. We have been engaged, of course, with the EU and with EFRAG on, on everything related to the corporate sustainability reporting directive, the CSRD, and the creation of the European Sustainability Reporting Standards, the ESRS. But we've also been in very close conversation with the IFRS Foundation and the ISSB um, on, on, on the creation of their own standards. So there's a lot of communication in that space when it comes to GRI. What's important to mention is because of the role that we have been, because we have been in this space, we're we have been pioneering this space. We have been here for 25 years. Today, we can say that if you write a report in accordance with the GRI standards, all of this data that you're producing can cover multiple reporting requirements for other frameworks or other rating uh, agencies or benchmarking uh, organizations. We have many resources available. Again, we're trying to work directly with the practitioners, the people uh, delivering the sustainability reports to provide them as many resources as we can. So we have um, mapping documents. We're working actually on a mapping document between the ESRS and the GRI standards. And that would be very useful for organizations that are already using GRI. Um, and also something, uh, yeah, we, we have some documents and of course we updated the universal standards, the GRI standards were updated and, and, and it was a major update, October, 2021. And this update means that we also are working on updating some other mapping documents uh, that we have. For instance, we have mapping documents with CDP. We have also um, documents on meeting the TCFD requirements using the GRI standards or li linking BLAB's impact assessment with the GRI standards. Of course, we have some public uh, documents out there about how to uh, link the GRI standards with the SDGs. So we, we create all of these suite of products, but also something that's very important to understand is in the whole process of putting together, of developing and updating our current sector, stand, our, our topic standards, but also our sectoral standards, because we have a sectoral program in which we will be developing standards for 40 different sectors. Our due process 
involves other stakeholders. And for instance, a good example would be on how we involve these stakeholders to, to try to ensure as much alignment as possible. We've recently updated the biodiversity standard and part of our, uh, one of the members of our technical committee for the update of the biodiversity standard is CDP. But at the same time, we are engaged in conversations with the TNFD framework on these standards. So from GRI, we're ensuring that throughout the development of our standards, we can create and build as much alignment as possible. I will finish it here. Thanks, Manuel. That was that was really useful. Um, and, and for those on the call today, I do think there, there's a tendency of what, what we've seen is for companies to jump into the, the topic specific standard. So they're going straight to that climate change standard or to the, the diversity standard. But just just to a suggestion to pull it back and make sure you do read those those standards that Manuel has just mentioned, the the, the first few in the series one to three, um, because they do help you report some of the, um, uh, the, 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 I suppose, the opening information on your, on, on your company um, and, and tell you how to, to report against the other standards. Um, now, I know we've, this has probably been integrated through all, all, the, all the questions already, but the regulation, um, we're just going to see sustainability reporting become mandatory for a much wider pool of companies in the EU. Um, and they've, and as Fran uh, mentioned in her presentation, they've signaled that the regulation will require companies to perform double materiality assessments and to have their information assured. Uh, so, Susie, I might come to you. Um, what you're doing to prepare for this? Um, I know you've probably touched on some of it, um, but what, like, what, yeah, what, what, what you're doing and what your, what your, um, your management team want wants from this. So for us to say that we're, it's pretty much entirely voluntary um, for a company of our size at this point. Um, so everything we're doing is in preparation for what will become, well, it, it's for two purposes, right? One, it's for in preparation for upcoming legislation and two, it's for investors because, you know, this ESG function would not exist were it not for investors saying, we need to know, we need to know more than about your your revenue and, and your your earnings per share or whatever it is we need to know what your your impacts are on people and planet um so by way of preparation this is the kind of thing that we're doing taking a look at the gri standards knowing that if we're doing um i think it was yourself Joanne, saying if, if we're good at tcfd and we're good at gri we're going to be ready um and then we'll have our ducks in a row and, and it won't come as a huge shock to the business if we've already built those relationships between the kind of uh, wheel and spoke between the ESG team and everybody around the business. And we've started to say to them over the period of a couple of years, I'll be coming to you for this data. I'll be coming to you for that data. And in the process, kind of building up our, our technology. So what I would say is on the one hand, there's what we're already doing. And then there's what still needs to happen. I haven't seen a really good single platform for ESG. And I think it's to do with that, again, the, the breadth of different types of data that are required. Um, but I I have a sense that it will happen. I think it'll become much more much more streamlined when the when the standards and the regulations start to coalesce. But what I would like to see is platforms that can be tailored so that they would be bespoke to individual um, kind of sectors. So that there might be good platforms out there but there would be a certain level of um, individuality built into them so that Karen isn't buying the same product as Lampier or Reiner or whoever. And that so the specific things, like there will be things that Joanne reports that a construction company will never need to report because that would be nonsense. Um, and there would be information that we'll need to put out that others won't. So I think hopefully when we see more consolidation, there will be better better platforms. So we have a platform for our kind of climate data, as in our, our emissions data, for want of a better description. Um, but beyond that, it's it's largely manual. So there's other um, kind of systems that exist within the business, but they're not talking to each other and they're not feeding into a single ESG repository. So I think technology is going to play a big part over, over the next couple of years in making this thing just less cumbersome and more auditable. So 
think you mentioned there, you know, if it's if it's going to need a certain level of assurance under CSRD, that's a whole different ball game. Um, manual processes just just don't hit the mark. Um, we're going to need a lot more automation. We're going to need a lot more um, kind of verification by by machine, um, all of that kind of thing. And the way that it exists now, I think well, it, it's just going to have to change. It's going to be um, like the shift. I know we talk about it a lot, but from, you know, accountants with pen and paper to where we are today, I think we'll see something like that in ESG because otherwise assurance will just be too difficult. Um, you won't be able to verify it to the standard that you, that you needed to. And obviously there's enormous risk in putting this information out there because if it's badly wrong, let's say in the, in the favorable direction, you can be accused of greenwashing. So I think we all need to, uh, to protect ourselves and get to a point where it's more automated. Brilliant. Thanks, Susie. Um, and Joanne, have you any comments? Yeah. yeah, I guess, look, I'm conscious of time, but like if I was to sum up the key piece, really, it's to understand the ask. Uh, and what I mean by that is really to, you know, break down amongst all the different regulations. And I guess a little bit different to Susie, I, I don't have the comfort of, of being in the voluntary space. We, we are very much hitting um, 24 um, mandatory requirements under CSRD. So there, there's an element of urgency around ensuring that our systems are built for purpose and, and will meet that external assurance requirement. So this last year was a big year and this year is kind of an even bigger year in terms of just to make sure that we have the right structures in place. So understanding the ask for us is looking at what the ESRAs require, mapping them to what we currently report. So very simply like our GRI or CDP, TCFD, and then really just breaking out where the gaps are and what are we need to do to, to close those gaps. And yeah, you know, like there's a, a lot of it, there's, there's no option in it because it's a mandatory requirement. We just need to stand up um, the resources behind it. So we kind of have that reporting roadmap project. And, and then in tandem, we're looking at our systems, our processes, or, you know, you know, making sure we have the right documentation in place, all of that, all of that good stuff. And then I guess that at a, at a business unit level or at a subject matter level that people are aware of what good looks like and what an, exter an external assurance standard um, is and, and just ensure that we're, we're supporting um, the relevant topic holders in, in what they need to produce uh, and that they're you know able to self-serve in a lot of ways in terms of standing over um, their data and then when we consolidate it in we have that layer of comfort so they're kind of they're they're the key elements there's a lot of work behind each of those but like they're all fundamentals and foundation stones for us being audit ready and I think we are intending on testing ourselves in Q3, Q4 with um, independent um, audit assessments just to make sure we do stand up to, to, to the rigor required. So, yeah, a, a lot of work ahead. <laughs> I don't envy you. Um, Manuel, I think you've probably covered off all the work you're doing with FRAG and the International Sustainability Standards Board. Um, and yeah, in the interest of time, I might just move on to the last uh, question, which is sustainability reports. Um, there's lots, obviously lots of different ways to report. You can report directly into a framework platform like CDP, um, which in some ways is easier to just put the information into a system rather than to have to do a, a whole report and, and look at editing it and graphic design and pictures and every, everything like that. Um, and they can be hard to do well, as everyone is, uh, Joanne and Susie is, have been saying, it's hard to get this information from uh, across the business. And, and you're publishing the information for quite a wide range of stakeholders. And as I suppose, as someone who reads lots of sustainability reports, you can often see who the, the key stakeholder is. Is it the investors or is it your customers? And they often come from one group. And then I actually think GRI, if you start using GRI, it really helps you move on from just giving information to that key stakeholder to all your stakeholders um so yeah so uh, i i don't know uh joanne joanne or, or susie uh do, do you want to, to just give some insight maybe on the practicalities of of, of preparing a, a report and how you get the the balance right in terms of providing that information i'm happy enough to because i'm yeah. uh, in the thick of it we've we're doing dotting, literally dotting I's and crossing T's today, um, going through all those final edits and finding stray letters here and there, that kind of thing. 
Um, I, the, the first big task, I guess, is deciding broadly what you want to say. So what's your strategy and what has your progress been on the key issues and, and what will the overall narrative be? And then when it gets into the practicalities, um, the most important thing is to be organized, I think. And we started our reports going out on Thursday next and we started with a skeleton last October but or last September and even before that there were conversations around the the flow and the design and how it would link with the annual report so that's a a long time a long build up um then it's a matter of you know again it goes back to the communication with all the different parts of the business who have the information and making sure that that chase them around the table to get that back in and make sure that it sounds it's one voice you know because it does come from diff disparate locations and people have different ways of communicating but when it goes into the report it needs to be seamless it needs to come from one organization um and then i guess when it gets closer to the time so say for the last eight weeks we've had a day-by-day -day calendar of um approvals for different parts of the report and who does it need to go to and on what date and, and how long do we have to fill in the feedback from that la layer of approval before it goes to the next person so that's full like every single day plotted out and who's on annual leave and how will that look um so i think being being organized and having built good relationships around your business are the, the two most practical tips i could give to to anyone starting out on their report and thanks, Susie. And just quickly, Joanne, do you, have you any comments? I know you're also in the thick of it at the moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm feeling the same pain as Susie. No, I, I think the point Susie raised is, is really important. And I'm just practical, like being organized. I, I guess for us, we have an annual report where there's a, a significant environmental sustainability section. And then we have a GRI report and then we have the website. So it's it's trying to decipher what what information and what level goes into those and, and that's something we've we've worked through and teased out and put a plan around but I think the points Susie raised are are very much echoed within our own organization as well yeah yeah I think I think the, the GRI index is a really helpful tool for people to use as well to 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 tick off where all the information is um so like as Joanne says on your website in your sustainability report in your annual report it's not that it all has to be in your sustainability report um but yeah Manuel have you any final yeah no no I and I understand that there's a lot of uh, there are a lot of challenges and, and again uh, I would say if, if today uh, you're reporting with GRI you're very well prepared to comply with what's coming uh, within the EU also uh, again we're very much aligned with the ISSB and what's coming at the global level uh, when we're talking about multinational organizations but also from GRI it's much more than just providing these mapping documents you can uh, reach out to, to us and I will be glad to, to share my email uh, via the chat because we can provide services in which we would be looking at the content index, which is basically the navigation tool for your sustainability report and the readers of your report. But we also have the GRI Academy of Professional Certification. If you want to get started using GRI, this be, would be a great starting point. Um, there's also a global network of uh, certified software and tool providers who can help you with all of these challenges around data collection. And of course, uh, there's the GRI Academy. Clear's team is a member of the GRI Academy. We're very uh, glad to have you with us. And yeah, I would also uh, would, would like to invite the organizations that are joining us today to reach out and we can uh, learn much more about what are the challenges that you're facing and how can we provide some support or guidance from, from GRI. Brilliant, thanks, Manuel. Um, I think most of the questions have been answered. Uh, we've only a minute left anyway. I think there's one there from Rachel just asking um, about public dis disclosures and credible tar target setting. How do you verify this? Um, great question, Rachel. Um, I think that remains to be seen. Like obviously you can get one of uh, the, uh, the financial auditors to do uh, um, verification. Um, but that I think all a lot has to be teased out. Obviously at Clearstream we do verification for the likes of carbon emissions. Um, but yeah, lots lots still to be seen in that that space, exactly how it will work for companies. Um, but yeah, on that note, uh, I'd just like to thank everyone online for joining today. I hope that's been of benefit for you. Um, and a thanks to our 
panelists, Manuel, Joanne and Susie for joining us today. And uh, Joanne and Susie, best of luck with uh, the reports. We look forward to reading them. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.